Bill and I. Okay? People think that flies are the keys to Bill and I. Okay? People think that flies are the keys to fishing. There's no question there's times when a person has a fly and nobody else has it and he catches the fish. But I can tell you more than anything, presentation and technique is much more important. Yet, there are thousands and thousands of flies. Why? Because we can't catch every fish. And every once in a while, there's a magic fly that works. I have hardly found a fly that ever works all the time. But as close as I can come to that would be probably the woolly bugger. That creation that started out as a woolly worm back in the 30s, a man by the name of Don Martinez really kind of put the uh, woolly worm on the map and eventually it became the woolly bugger. We added rubber legs and it became the yuck bugger. There are more different varieties of this fly, but I can tell you something. The tip is you always have some. To pick out flies, there are some basic rules, and we're going to go to Cabela's and we're going to visit with uh, a man I've had a good time uh, coaching over the years. Welcome to Cabela's. As you can see, we're standing here in front of a large fly selection. Most of our stores have a great selection of flies, and flies are an intricate part of your uh, tackling fly fishing. Of course, we need something to catch fish with. When you walk into a fly shop, there's so many choices, it's hard to decide exactly what you need to take to uh, fool the fish. So we're going to make that a little easier for you and narrow down a few basic patterns to make your time on the water much easier. To start with, let's break down a couple of uh, basic varieties of flies. You have dry flies, which are designed to float on the surface above the water. A trout would then come up from the bottom or near the surface and take a dry fly that's floating on top of the surface. All other flies sink below the surface. They would be called nymphs or wet flies or streamers. So a nymph or a wet fly, generally speaking, is something that, f that you fish below the surface and you can swing them, you can dead drift them, there's lots of ways to fish those, where a streamer would be something that you animate. You get it to sink and you actually make the streamer swim through the water column. So a very simple way to remember, dry flies are dry. They float, wet flies or nymphs sink. Streamers are another uh, wet fly or nymph. Let's talk about a few basic patterns that are going to be crucial to your success. One tip I might give you is that most anglers when they start spend far too much time worrying about having many, many different patterns and not nearly enough time spent perfecting their presentation. Presentation is a lot uh, of what makes a fly fisher a very, very great angler. When we talk about flies, we have basic flies that you'll find anywhere on the planet. At Cabela's, you'll see we have lots and lots of flies, and sometimes you walk in here and you go, man, I'm going to go to the, this river or that river or this lake or that lake, and you need to know what to get. Well, one, talk to one of our outfitters. They can help you get a great selection of flies, but if there's not somebody available, there's lots that we can get you. They're very, very simple. Things like a woolly bugger, like this guy right here. A woolly bugger is a streamer imitation, a fly that is designed to be moved, designed to have movement built into the fly. Again, the streamer is something we're going to animate. We're going to make this fly move. So a woolly bugger uses a marabou tail that's very soft and breathes in the water. It has a soft hackle fiber that wraps around the body. This can imitate a leech or a small minnow or even a crayfish. Another favorite wet fly of mine, or nymph more correctly, is a stonefly. A stonefly is something that lives, it's an insect that lives on the bottom of the river. They like oxygenated water and uh, they tend to be on the larger side of a lot of the flies that we fish. Stoneflies can be a great mill for a big fish. Get them down near the bottom and let the fish do the rest of the work. Another favorite fly is a pheasant tail. Pheasant tail is a very general pattern imitating mayfly nymphs. You can get them beaded or non. I like bead heads because they help them sink and get down to where the fish live. Mayflies will live in nearly all water types from lakes to rivers and uh, 
you'll find that they are very, very active during most of the summer months. Another favorite of mine is a fly called a rainbow warrior. It's a small, flashy fly that doesn't really imitate anything in particular, but the fish eat it. We call these attractors. And when fish take a fly, we don't argue with that success. So that's a great attractor pattern when all else fails. Another favorite nymph is a prince. A prince nymph, again, is an attractor. Doesn't imitate any one insect, just kind of a general description or a very descriptive pattern. This could be a stonefly, could be a caddis, even could be a damselfly. Whatever the fish take it as, as long as they take it, we like it in our box. The last nymph I'd like to show you is a hare's ear. A hare's ear is another very descriptive type pattern. Could be a mayfly, could be a stonefly, could even be a caddis. Very basic fly that you could catch fish with anywhere. Let's change gears here and talk a little bit about dry flies. We talked about nymphs a second ago. Nymphs and wets again sink. Dry flies you fish on the surface, so above the water. Dry flies are a lot of fun to fish. You see the fish actually come out of the water and take the fly. One of my favorite ways to fish. Dry flies again come in different types of, uh, of patterns. You have attractors like this royal wolf. This doesn't imitate any one particular insect again, just a great all-around pattern. It's got peacock curl on it. It has a red tag in the middle, a little highlight, if you will, or a hot spot, and it has some big white wings that are easy for us to see. Great fly to have in any fly box. Another attractor is a parachute atoms. Parachute atoms is a general mayfly imitation that has a white post on the top. Now, the white post a lot of anglers look at it and go, I don't think that looks much like a mayfly, but in reality, we're not. We're, the trout aren't looking at that wing, we are. That white wing's for us. They're looking at it from a bottom silhouette, which looks a lot like a mayfly. Parachute atoms, again, a very good betis imitation or bluing olive, but can be used in any situation. One of my favorite stream and lake flies. Another mayfly we get a lot in the west is a PMD. Out east, they're called sulfurs. They're a little different insect out east, but a similar color. They're kind of a yellowish color and a very popular fly to have through the summer months in almost any trout stream in the country. PMDs, again, a mayfly. They have a nymph, so you might use a pheasant tail nymph to imitate their nymphal form, and then they will emerge to the surface, hatch into an adult, and there we have our PMD. Next, we have a caddis. This is an elk hair caddis. Elk hair has hollow fire, is, so it helps this fly float. Caddis basically look like a small moth. And from the silhouette of this wing, you'll notice that it has a moth-like appearance underneath to the fish. Very good fly again for the summer months. Another type of fly is a terrestrial. Terrestrials live on land rather than in the water, but we find that, that they end up in the water. Ants and grasshoppers and beetles and things like that end up on bankside vegetation and the wind can blow them in the water off. A little ant like this can produce a lot of fish especially tight to a bank. Another favorite pattern for terrestrials is a grasshopper. A grasshopper is a big meal for a trout and is a lot of fun to fish. Usually you get explosive takes on the grasshopper. Again, a fly that will float in the surface, easy for us to see. And uh, a great fly to have a, to fish a nymph blow when you uh, fish a dry with a dropper. Hoppers usually have enough buoyancy to hold up that other fly. So a grasshopper pattern. So I thought we'd take our friends out there through some of the uh, cast and... Uh... One of the hardest aspects to this fly fishing and casting is wind. <laughs> it comes at the most inopportune times, like all the time. And you gotta learn how to handle it. And I'm gonna give you my basic wind lesson. And it's really simple for you to understand. I want you to, when you uh, go out in your car next, and you're driving down the freeway or out in the highway, I want you to put your arm out. And, and if you just stick your arm out in the wind, out of the window, it's just going to stay there. That's a good straight cast. Now, I want you to start taking your hand like this, and what's going to happen, it's going to go whop right back to the window. Why? Because that is the front part of your fly line. It's going to be catching the wind, which will be coming into you as you make your cast. Think of this as the front part of your fly line. Now, and here's the key to learning how to cast in the wind. 
You take your hand like this, tilt it down, and you'll be able to just easily push your hand into the wind. It's all about aerodynamics. When you have this big, wide front loop into the wind, it causes lift and you're trying to push this into the wind and the wind's going to blow it back and the more you try to push it out, the more you try to cast harder, the, the, the least far it'll go. It just won't go out at all. Now we're going to let the rod show you how to change the cast. I want you to visualize if you were standing like we are right now. We're standing on a plane and I'm making a straightforward cast. There's no wind and we're, and we're just like that hand being out in the window. Nice and even. Now what we're going to do is change the word is angle of attack, like in a wing. The angle of attack is going to be changed by the path of your rod. Now right now the path of the rod is basically I'm using the tip. It's going back and forth. Now look what's going to happen. We're going to go up and straight down up and straight down. In other words, it's like I've taken my body and tilted it so I'm casting this direction. It has to do with your stroke. We're going to shorten the stroke, raise the arm, and then we're going to pull down at this angle like this. We're going to pull down. Now what that does is flattens out the rod. It flattens the rod and changes the angle of your line. And you know, you might say, well, wow, this is casting in the wind. This is going to help me. But you know what else is going to help you? It's going to help you cast those strike indicators and those multiple flies and those great big woolly buggers. You won't have to do that chuck and duck cast. You're going to be able to cast it much better because it's going to help you in all your casting, knowing how to change the direction and angle of attack of your cast. Now let's take a look at it right here. Here we go, the wind's coming at us. We're going to go into the wind. We're going, to, we're going to change the direction of the cast by not going too far back. One of the first mistakes that most anglers do is they let the line go back here and then they try to push all that line forward. In other words, as we come up, the wind is going to help us by pulling that line and accelerating it. We're going to catch the wind, then by pulling back down, we're going to change that angle of attack just like that hand out in that car. And you're going to see how easy it is. The first thing you do is you get out in the wind and you start pulling down. Now some of you are going to do this. You're going to start trying to push the tip. You're going to try pulling like that. And, that, and look where the, where the rod's going to go. It's going to be like that. And they're going to say, drive the tip in. Drive the tip in. It's not the tip. It's pulling down on the butt. Notice where my arm is going. This is a very important stroke to learn, and it's a finesse stroke. You practice it a lot. A little bit later on, we're going to start talking about hauls. And when you combine it, now I'm going to just show you. The scales to the fish more often. The spring and fall have some good options for some great fishing. Some of it's below the surface, fishing nymphs, but fishing streamers is another good way to, to fish in the fall and spring. Gives you an opportunity for catching the bigger fish, especially with fall runs or brown trout. The leech is fairly large. It's a six, number six leech, and my scud pattern's a number 12, so I've got a, a disparity in size. Well, Jack's fishing with a clear intermediate and a couple of patterns. You've got a small scud pattern on and a leech pattern. And one of the important tricks you can learn when fly fishing still waters is uh, counting the fly line or the, and the flies down. And what that means is Jack has simply made his cast and he's going to count to a preset figure he's uh, determined based on the depth that we're fishing. We're about nine feet here and the known sink rate of the fly line. Typically the clear intermediates, depending on the manufacturer, sink from an inch and a half to two inches per second. So he's just going to cast that line out, maybe let it sink 20 counts. You can use the sweep hand of your watch as a great uh, technique as well. And then start